Tonight I'd like to preach to you on a subject called how to be miserable. How to be miserable. We talked about it a little bit this morning, and tonight uh, we're going to do that. There were a lot of people that said, you know, I don't have any burdens. I don't have anything, anything that's lading me down. So I figured I'd help some of you and learn how to be miserable than to make you want to run to the Lord. There's a psychologist named Randy Patterson. He did a, an experiment, and he's done it more than once, with a, a group of people who are depressed and miserable and, and uh, you know, have nothing to live for. And so he brings them into a group, uh, as a group, to a room, and he says, I want you to, uh, he said, I want you to imagine something. Imagine that you could win that $10 million that's sitting on the table. There's not really $10 million on the table, but he says that. $10 million on the table, and you can win that. You can win it if you can make yourself a little more miserable by tomorrow. By tomorrow around this time, if you can make yourself a little bit more miserable, I'll give you that $10 million. And he said, well, let's, let's talk about that. He said, uh, what are some of the things that you could do if you wanted to be more miserable? Let's write that down. What do you think? And he gets out the whiteboard and people say, well, uh, um, I probably would... Uh, Binge ice cream eating. I just eat ice cream until I couldn't hardly move. Oh, good. We'll write that down. Uh, I would just, I would just walk around and say negative things to people all day. All right, write that down. And he said, start writing things down. He said, after a while, people they realize a couple things. He said uh, they realize that they two things. One, they actually do have a little control over their mood. More than they thought. They could never get better. I mean, no one can ever get better or feel better when you're depressed and discouraged. But you could feel worse. You could actually make yourself feel worse. So you have a little bit of control over how you feel. And number two, he said, uh, they realized they were already doing a lot of the things that they were writing down on that list. And so it started them thinking about maybe that's why I'm miserable. Because I'm doing these things. Now, it's obviously very funny, but I'm telling you guys, the mind plays all kinds of tricks on you. You know this, right? And it tells you all kinds of lies and says a lot of things that you uh, believe in the moment, and then you find out later they're not really true. And And actually, you know they're not true at the time, but they just seem to be true. They've got to be true. So we're going to talk about how to be miserable tonight. I want you to go to Philippians chapter 4. How to be miserable. Philippians chapter 4. The first thing I want to encourage you to do if you'd like to be miserable, and I sometimes will preach a message, and for those of you that maybe have not been here before, you've not heard me preach before, I'm just going to say that uh, sometimes I preach sarcastic messages. Okay, so if you don't get this, this message is actually a sarcastic message. Really, our goal is not to help you be miserable. You don't need help in that. But it's a sarcastic thing. It's like, you know, okay? So you can just remember that. So the first thing you can do if you want to be miserable is become a storage unit for bad news and negative thinking. Uh, and a lot of folks miss this. They, they, uh, they look for ways to be happy and things like that. That's not how you stay miserable. If you want to stay miserable, you continually take in negative things. It's very important to do this if you're going to remain miserable because uh, you don't want to have a spark of a time you know, where you're like, maybe things will get better. They will not get better. And you must continue to feed yourself bad information. So what you'll do, a lot of folks do, is they'll watch TV a lot, a lot of news, Take in CNN, Fox News, uh, you know, MSNBC, whatever it is, that helps a lot. Talk radio is also very helpful to keep you, uh, to keep you miserable. Um, another very, f- people find it very effective, is Facebook. Facebook helps you because there's a lot of reasons uh, to hate yourself. And you don't even realize that until you get on there and see other people's kids and homes and vacations and cruises and... <laughs> Uh, all these things, and, and until you see that, you really don't even understand what it, what it means to be miserable. But then, once you see that their perfect life, then you realize, wow, I, I have a long way to go in this. I could be a lot more miserable. I hate myself. I hate my children. I hate my family. I hate my house. I hate that little camper we got, the little fold-up job. What's that? That's nothing. And uh, I, I just hate all of our plans, and I hate my life. 
You got to keep these bad thoughts coming in. Now, see, isn't that sound crazy when you say that? What if you intentionally went out to make yourself miserable? You see, these things that we're going to talk about tonight, they don't, you don't intentionally go out there and go, okay, I'm, I got a couple options. I'm going to choose the one that makes me miserable. It just happens. How does water get in your basement? You think it's sealed. You think you have the unbelievable system, and then your hot water heater breaks, right? And then your basement is flooded, even though you have this unbelievable system that keeps everything out. How does it get in there? You don't have to throw a switch. It just happens. You lose tire, air pressure in your tires. How does it happen? You, it just happens. Your life, you, you wake up one day and you're miserable. How does it happen? I don't know how it happens. It just does. But one thing I know, that if you wanted to be miserable, this would be one way you could do it. You could intentionally look for bad things. You ever find yourself doing this, not intentionally, but you're doing it? What's the answer? Well, I think there's an answer in Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Well, that's one impossible verse to obey. How can you do it? He gives you a few, a few options here. He said, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, have some balance in your life. Moderate yourself. Medium. Don't always go for extra large. Medium, possibly. Don't you love how they change it? When I was a kid, large was large. Now, large is actually small. <laughs> I want a small, and it's a large. It used to be, it used to be small. They literally, remember, you used to get small cups of, of pop. When you went to McDonald's. Now there is no such thing. Now it's like, I'll take a medium, and you have to carry it out in a five-gallon cont- you know, and you can't get it into your thing, and, and uh, it sloshes everywhere. <laughs> right? What, but let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Be full of care for nothing. And the peace of God, which passeth under all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You say, well, I just want to be a realist. Well, then you're not being a biblicist. Because if you don't balance your thought life out with not just things that are true. Yes, I know those people died. Yes, I know the building collapsed. Yes, I know the skyscraper came down. I know that they drowned and they were burned alive. And they and I know someone cheated on someone and stole something and bought, you know, cheated. I I understand all of the terrible things that happened. And yes, you need to hear about these things perhaps and be in the loop, so to speak. But I would challenge you, I would challenge you this way. Do you balance out whatsoever things are true and honest with whatsoever things are just? And whatsoever things are pure and lovely and of good report. You see how we find it so easy to lock into just one or the other. Some people live in la-la land because all they think about is just wonderful. You get these emails and, and it's like... The golden age of Christianity. Everything is wonderful and great. And just, just give Jesus a hand and kiss your brother and sister in the Lord. And, and let's hold hands. And, and here's a puppy for you and a heart that's beating somehow in the email. And, and, and all of these wonderful... And sometimes you want to send them a few things to say, Hey, wait, we're still living in, in 21st century America. Come down to earth. But you ever think about, we maybe should like take the emails we get from the naysayers and the doomsdayers and send them all of the hearts and the flowers emails and then mix it up for the other people. I'm glad you have a great attitude, but here's something to bring you down to earth. The truth is, it takes balance in your mind and heart. You don't necessarily think about that. But he said here, think on these things. And these words are commands. They are, they, they are to be done. God said, rejoice in the Lord, verse 4. Let your moderation be known. Be careful for nothing. Think on these things. You see, we are are wired to be aware of disasters. I wonder how many of you have ever driven past a wreck without sneaking a peek. I'm not going to look at that. I'm just going to pray for him. 
I'm not going to look. Why? It, why? We have to. First, we've got to know why we've been sitting in traffic for three hours. So we look over the right. Are you kidding me? That's what's keeping us here? And uh, then secondly, you just have to know, is there blood? Is there guts? Is there something? You know, there's got to be something. And we just naturally look that way. Why? Well, thankfully, there's a lot of people that love to jump out and help if they could. And uh, they do that. I mean, you've been involved, I'm sure, in accidents or been around them. And people just stop right in the middle. They're finally like, yes, I can run in traffic. Like mom said, I never could. Stop right here. Run out and just start helping people. You know, they don't even know what they're doing. They don't know CPR or anything. They're just like, can I hold something or call somebody? And I think that's wonderful. But th- there's something about wrecks that really draws, you know, and, and disasters. It's like, what is that? You know, and, and every time on the news, they always make everything out to be an update, a fresh alert, just in, this just in. And, and you know, it's been coming in 24 hours a day since they were a network. And, and, and what does that do? I think that at some point you have to balance and, and moderate your intake of bad news. Because if you don't, you're going to be miserable. You're walking around carrying other people's burdens that you don't have the power to carry. You wonder why you can't stand up. You weren't designed to stand and walk with that much burden. You can't possibly rejoice in the Lord when you're trying to carry everyone else's burdens. Well, like we talked about this morning, you and I can't even carry our own burdens, let's, let alone somebody else's. We've got to go to the Lord. And let me just tell you, there comes a point when you have to say, you know what? The world's a mess, but God's in control with the old clap, you know, light. Good night. Go to sleep. Oh, well. Go to sleep. That's what you need to do. And if you can't do that, you're going to lay awake at night with something gnawing at your insides. Somebody's got to do something. I just don't know what's going on. I just think that, you know, it's so interesting. I've never seen so many people invested in this last election. In church, that is. I've never seen so many people invested. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be. I think the Lord heard our prayer and answered our prayer. I really do. I think he gave us a little bit of reviving in our bondage. But the truth is, other than prayer, most of us had very little to do with all the back and forth and the push and the pull and the up and the down and the black and the white and the negative and the positive. We really had very little to do with that. But what does that mean? We, shouldn't be, you know, we should moderate and balance all of the negativity and the pressure with the reality that I'm not really that important. I'm really not as integral to the success of the world as I might think. It's helpful when you know he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got it. He doesn't need me to carry it because I couldn't carry it anyhow. So if you want to be miserable, first of all, become a storage unit for bad news. Here's another one. If you'd like to be miserable, hold grudges. Hold grudges. That'll help you a great deal. Here's what you do. If someone ever does anything wrong to you, if they say something, if they say something negative to you, or they, say a, they give you a slight of some kind, or if they look at you, or if they, if they like, mm, to you, <laughs> do not forget that. I, I'm going to tell you this. If you don't remember it, who will? You need to remember it. Never forget when someone said something to you that was unkind, when someone gave you the cold shoulder, or said a snarky comment and walked away. Do not forget this. This It's very important if you want to be miserable. You have to hold on to grudges. You must demand that people come to you and apologize for what they did to me, and I will not forget this until they do. And when they come to me and they offer an apology, that apology will not be accepted. Because apparently, with your little apology, you don't realize how much you hurt me. You hurt me so badly. And your little apology can't fix it. And this is what will help you hold on to your miserable state for, the, for a long, long time. There are some people it can last a lifetime. If you nurse it, if you play your cards right, you can take one negative comment and you can milk that thing all the way out till the end of your life. And that'll be your last thought. And then you'll die. It's helpful. I would say this, too. You need to demand people, as far as the grudges are concerned, demand that people perform up to a certain predetermined by you level. They must, they must perform to that spec. I would, I would suggest that you do not believe that people can change. Do not give people the benefit of the doubt because they are devils. 
You give them the benefit of the doubt, what are they going to do? They're going to do worse next time. You don't look at them and think the best of them. Why? Because they don't have the best in mind. They have the worst in mind. And they're coming after you. And they're going to get you. And not only that, they're going to get your pretty little dog, too. (laughs) And they're going to get your kids. And they're going to, actually, probably after your ministry. I'll tell you what it is. They have jealousy in their heart. And if you forgive them, it's like you're condoning sin. You, you, are, you are helping them be bad Christians by forgetting what they did. Who's going to hold them accountable? Who is going to hold their feet to the fire? Somebody, I, I'll tell you one thing. If you forget it and everyone else forgets it, then they'll probably cancel the judgment of Christ. Because it, it's, it's like someone has to remember this. And I really feel like if you were wrong, you're the one. You're the one. Now, see, do you like the sarcasm? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how we really do hold on to miserableness? We do it. Why? Because those people, they think they're, like we, my sisters used to say growing up, I don't know where they got this, but they used to say, you think you're hot snot on a silver platter. <laughs> but you're really cold boogers on a paper plate. Okay? <laughs> so you, you just need to recognize, sorry, sorry. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Hold, hold grudges, people. Hold them. Hold tight. Remember the slights. Remember the glances. Remember when she intentionally wore the same clothes that you wore. Remember when he said something to your kid. Remember that. And if you do that, I guarantee you'll have a good shot. I'm not saying you'll be successful. you have a good shot at being miserable. You'll have a real good shot at it. Look at Galatians 5 says. Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Well, where did that church go? It was a strong, growing church. They ate each other alive. That's where it went. They ate each other up. Where did that marriage go? They devoured one another. Where did that friendship in the church go? They bit on one another so many times, snapping at each other with their jaws, that before long there was nothing left to snap at. There was no point in coming to church Because all you're going to do is hate on everybody there. You say, I would never get that way. I hope you wouldn't. But I tell you one thing. It doesn't start with full-on beast mode rage. It starts with a little slight that you won't give the person the other benefit of the the doubt. You won't look at them and say, well, they, they love the Lord and mean it. You might say that, but in your heart you're going, no, they don't. If they loved the Lord, they'd come down and, they, and they'd throw themselves at my feet and they would say, please forgive the wrongs that I have done. Guys, that rarely happens. It rarely happens that someone comes back to you and says, you know what? I said something to you that I shouldn't have said. I acted in a way I shouldn't have acted. I, did, I was mean to you and I shouldn't have done it. Guys, I'll tell you this. Young people, a lot of times... Uh, Adults say things and do things to you that they may or may not really mean to come across in a certain way, and they do. And if you walk away from them, and in your heart you go, everybody hates me. The devil likes that kind of thing. Because that's, that's, that's a place we can grow a nice little seed, a seed of bitterness, a seed of hatred. It's amazing when people leave the church and you find out what offended them. How is it possible? Let me just say, the original seed wasn't really enough to get them out of church. It was the fact they let the seed grow and grow and grow and the root of bitterness springing up troubled them. It choked the life out of them. How many of you have heard of, of epic, epic arguments that people are they're at each other? For instance, how about the Hatfields and the McCoys? And how when you go back to find out, it comes down to somebody's uh, pig. I think they shot a pig that went on somebody else's land. And all these 
Decades and decades and decades and hundreds of, years, hundreds of years go by, and people are still fighting and killing. And now they're killing, why? Not because of the pig. They're killing because that person's a Hatfield, that person's a McCoy. When you find yourself you can't stand being around somebody, like you, you don't like them, like you want to... Let me just tell you, you have a problem in your spiritual life. You're not right with God. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy to just get past it. But why? Because people are mean. People are irritating. They do weird things to you. They do unkind things. They'll say things that are not fair, that are not good. And if you allow them to, they will become the puppet master in your life. And what happens to them? They move on, forget all about it. And you're stuck there because of what somebody said. And you'll not move an inch in your Christian life. How can you allow the love of God to flow through you when you're holding it back going, no love, no love for them until they come? No, they're not going to do it. They're moving on. They're happy. They're enjoying their life. I hate their life. Hate their little kids and they dress them up for church and bring them in. It's crazy. You say, is that possible in church? Yeah, it is. It happens. It shouldn't happen, but it does. If you bite and devour one another, you're going to consume one another. You know what the worst part about it is? When one person is biting, biting in their heart, and the other person has no idea about it, and they disappear, and this person is happy. What happened? You consumed yourself. You chewed yourself up. Hey, if you're going to go out because of somebody, at least get into a knockdown drag out because of them. Don't have this virtual shadow boxing fight where you're upset and mad at this person, and they have no idea. You know what I think the Lord would prefer? I think, A, prefer for you to swallow your pride and say, hey, you did wrong to me, you shouldn't have said that, but guess what? I've done a whole lot worse. I'm the one that put Jesus on the cross, so I can't really talk about what you did to me. And then if you can't swallow it, then go to them and talk to them about it and say, you know, you really bothered me with something. I think the Lord would prefer you to do that second option than for you to get mad and stay mad for the rest of time. But you don't want to give them that, because if you give them that, that means that somehow they did something to you. They hurt you, and now you're giving them hand in in this thing, and you can't give people hand. You can't let them think that somehow you were affected by them. You see how the pride starts kicking in? So if you want to be miserable, hold grudges. I'll give you a third one. Here's one. uh, Go to Ephesians chapter 6. And these are not necessarily in order or a very good order at all. They're just some random thoughts that I thought, you know, if you wanted to be miserable, this would be some good ideas. Here's one. Compare your spouse or your kids to other spouses or kids. Or imagined people. The perfect spouse or kids in your mind. Compare them. This is a great way to be miserable. Because you can say this. Honey, why can't you be more like so-and-so? Now, you would never come out and say that. But you would drop hints. You know, you go over to their house for dinner, and then you just rave on and on about those uh, sticky buns that she made. They're just unbelievable. The greatest thing. Oh, my soul. Why don't you... Oh. Or you see your kids, and you're like, why can't you be more like, you know, well, you know, so-and-so, he really is really good at math. So-and-so is really good at, at playing lacrosse. Why can't, why can't you... Or, uh, Oh, no, your mom and I love you. See, we have in our heads this idea. The devil will use this to make you miserable. If you want to be miserable, compare your spouse to other spouses. Have in your mind this idea that there's a perfect one out there, and there is not a perfect one out there. I'll tell you what you should do with your, with your kids. Look at Ephesians 6, 4. You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You've got the kids that God wanted you to have. Now listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And don't just let them run roughshod and do whatever they want to do. But don't hold it to some standard of what some other kid is. You know, a lot of times we see the outside of someone. And we see, we see that we think, man, look at all that character. Look at all. They look so great. We don't see the inside. We might see someone's spouse and say, now that's the spouse. That's what I'm talking about. That wasn't even on the market when I was looking for a spouse. <laughs> But you're not at home with him or her. You don't know how he or she handles the stress that you, your family is under. You don't know how much, uh, what their irritating characteristics or tendencies are. You don't know that. The de- what I'm saying is the devil will get in there and he will say to you, if you had that, you'd be better off. 
And it's a good way to be miserable. Why? Because scripture just says, stay married. And it says, love your kids and raise them up. Love them. You know what the, the, the sad thing is? They're probably not going to be, here, here's the scary truth. They're probably not going to be as great as you think they're going to be. But you know what another great thing is? They're probably not going to be as bad as you think they're going to be. Probably somewhere right in the middle. And I would say the same with your spouse. Your spouse may not be the most amazing. And when people talk about, you know, they get on, their, on Facebook and, and, and they get on, uh, you'll hear sometimes emails we get. People, like, my husband is amazing, all caps. And I'm thinking, who cares? I don't care if your husband's amazing. I don't care if your wife is amazing. You're married to them. Isn't that enough? Or do you got to go around and tell everybody, just by the way, I, ha- I have the most amazing marriage. It's awesome. Well, then have it. I don't care if you have it or don't have it. Well, I got enough to deal with in my own marriage. I'm working in my own family. I don't need to have the perfect fairy tale, but why? We can't ever just be ourselves. We've got to be extremely awesome 24 hours a day. I don't want to just have shoes. I want to have the brand new shoes, not of this quarter, of this week. I want to have the nicest video game. I want to have the nicest clothes. I want to have the nicest bike. I want to have the nicest car, the nicest house. I want to be the top notch and the best family and the best everything. And we're just amazing. Guys, we buy into brands too much. We buy into brands. Hey, when you, many of you, when you were growing up, there was like uh, one or two brands that were kind of known. And everybody else just wore clothes. It's like, what are you wearing? What are you wearing? Clothes. Well, who made them? What? What are you talking about? Out of sight, man. Far out, man. Listen to this guy. Why? Because you didn't, it wasn't all about brands. Now we're down to the sub-brands. It's like you can't just have uh, Ralph Lauren. You know, you got to have like the certain slim fit type of thing. And they got to be like aged denim and they've got to have this certain look and certain hold and sag and certain look. I'm naked, look, but I'm wearing jeans. You know, it, it's craziness, my friends. It's craziness. And you're constantly looking to find that perfect, perfect thing, and it's just not out there. It's not out there. Look at Ephesians 5.25. What should I do with my spouse? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not very good naming the Ralph Lauren jeans. Forgive me. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, work on your wives, even as Christ also, nope, that doesn't work, does it? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Just love them. You know, uh, Paul told Titus to instruct the young women to love their husbands. Just love them. Well, if I just love them as they are, they'll never change. There you go again, thinking other people's thoughts for them. You think that if you accept them, they don't want to change. They don't want to improve. They don't want to do anything but just sit around and be a fat, lazy slob. That's what you think about them. And by the way, if you think that about someone, doesn't that come out in your interactions with them? If you think that your kids are horrible and terrible and they never do anything, don't you think that comes out at some point in your interactions with them? I think it does. So if you want to be miserable, just try to find the ideal spouse somewhere, not yours, and the ideal children out there, and constantly compare them and hold them in your mind. And even if you don't say it keep, it, keep that deep down in your heart. And that'll help you be miserable. You won't want to come home. And you won't want to see your spouse. And every time you're with your kids, it's a learning. It's Proverbs of the day, kids. Everyone sit down and listen to Dad as he goes on a monologue about how you're horrible. Here's another option for you if you want to be miserable. See only two extreme options. See only two extreme options. So you have, for instance, you say, I'm going to either eat the rest of the chocolate chip cookies. That's the only option I really have. The other option is start a diet program, exercise where I'm going to the gym six times a week and crazy schedule and running all over the place and drinking three gallons of water a day. Ridiculous! I'll eat the cookies. <laughs> right? Isn't that the way our mind works sometimes? It's like, well, I don't, there's no choice. That's it. I can either be Judas Iscariot or Jesus Christ. So forget it. I'm probably more like Judas, so 
I'll just do that. We, 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 you know, I can't be super Christian. I can't be amazing and read all the chapters that Brother Gip reads. So, Lord knows my heart. I can't read today. That's all there is to it. I heard somebody say, well, you know, sometimes I don't go to church because I'm like, you know, Holy Spirit couldn't speak to me in this, in this uh, attitude anyhow. So, you're, 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 you're trying to choose between two false extremes. Okay? You ever consider the fact that, uh, go to Mark 9.24. Mark 9.24. It's kind of like uh, my time horizon suddenly gets completely changed. Now everything is inward. Now I just have to get through today. Today. I just got to get through today. There's no hope for tomorrow. Just got to get through. And if, and, if, and if watching TV three hours today helps me get through the day, if, if eating all of that ice cream helps me get through the day, if crying my eyes out just helps me get through the day, guys, there may be more options than that. There may be, well, if I can't be the greatest Christian, then just forget it. You're being a baby. You're being a baby. Look at Mark 9.24. Here's reality. And straightway the father of the child cried out. We won't read the passage for sake of time. Straightway for the father, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Now, is there a period after that? No, it continues on. Lord, I believe. Now, the Lord said he had to believe if it was going to happen. And he said, Lord, I believe. And then help thou mine unbelief. That's the Christian life right there. See, we want to live on one side or the other. We want to say, well, I am, I'm an unbeliever. I just don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't, I don't understand it. It's not logical. It's not scientific. So forget it. I'm going to live in unbelief. <laughs> you're going to put faith in something, big guy. You're going to put faith in something. So you're not living a life without faith. You're just not putting faith, any faith in God. So you're over here in unbelief. Or you want to be on the other side and say, I'm going to climb to the climb every mountain. I'm going to have the scripture calendar where every day I wake up and tear it off. And there's another promise from God. And we're climbing higher. I wake up in the morning and Gabriel wakes me. It's time for devotions. Oh, thank you, Gabriel. Very good. Uh, and then uh, here comes another angel. And they, we gather together. We kneel down. Guys, it's great to be with you this morning. Actually, I'm kind of, they're so tall and amazing and heavenly. And I just look up to them and they're smiling down at me. And golden beams of sunshine are coming in. Coffee is brewing. And things are wonderful. I love being saved. And if I can't have that every day, forget it. That's not how life is. Lord, I believe. And I also got a bunch of unbelief in me as well. That's reality. What? So you want to be miserable. You try to live in one of those two extremes. You can't do it. What you have to say is, Lord, with all I got in me, which is not a lot, I'm giving it to you. I believe your word. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read my Bible. Why? Because I don't want to. That's why. I'm going to read my Bible because God never says anything. But I'm going to cheat my flesh today. I am going to tell that old lion stinking flesh, you don't get your way today. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to prove that God never talks to me. And guess what? He might not. So what do you do the next day? Well, then forget it. I guess the whole thing is not even real. You're acting like a baby. If you want to be miserable, see only two extreme options. What you need to recognize, it's more of a priority. And which one is the yin and the yang? I don't know. I don't know. But by faith, I'm going to push through the fog today, this week. And I'm going to say, Lord, I believe. You say you're making something, you're trying to make something happen that's not even true. No, that's not it. I'm believing something that I don't believe. That's hard to do. But there's a part of me that does believe it. Because I know it's true. And I have to push through, and that's what faith is. It's not feeling wonderful and spiritual every day. Faith is doing what you know God wants you to do, even though you don't feel like it. Pushing through the fog of your mind, and of the junk around you, and of your family situation, and of your health. Pushing through and saying, Lord, I believe. Help thou my name, Lord. <laughs> I hope this thing has a good seatbelt, because I don't know how we're going to do it. But I'm getting in, and I'm strapping myself in, and here we go. Another way you can stay miserable is to see yourself as a victim. To see yourself as a victim. Now, this is an important thing, because not everyone recognizes how hard you've had it. Not everyone around you knows that you've been through it. So it's important for you to always keep in the forefront of your mind that you have been wronged. 
Now, this is similar to the grudge situation, but this can go a little bit further. Because in the grudge situation, that's a lot of times just things that somebody, you know, said or, or you know, had an attitude towards you. But when you're a victim, you have a right to wilt. You have a right to be in a puddle on the floor. People have done bad things to you. They have done things physically to you. They have done things emotionally to you. They have done things mentally to you. And in many cases, you were almost in a prison and could not get out of it. And they did things that no one should ever do. And now you are a victim. And I'm telling you that, that this is a tough one to shake. Because there are, there, there's a lot of truth in the fact that you've been wrong. You've been hurt. And I say with no sarcasm whatsoever, you have been victimized. Someone has made you a victim through what they've done or said. But I'll tell you this. If you stay a victim, it'll be of your own choice. And it will make you miserable. It will keep you miserable. You say, I have no idea what, you have no idea what I've been through. I, 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 would, I would beg to differ. I've heard a lot of junk. Ever since I can remember, I've heard about junk that's happened to people's lives. And I mean junk. And maybe your story can trump all that. I don't know. But I know this. Whoever decides I am a victim is going to be miserable. Why? Because you have identified yourself as someone who deserves more than what they've got. And if I, there's no way for me to remain a victim if I have what I deserve... I always have what I deserve is out there. I have been wronged, and out there is my justice. Out there it will make things right. Somewhere down the track, I am going to be able to get a hold of my uh, perpetrator, the person that wronged me, and I'm going to grab a hold of his neck, and I'm going to pop his head off, and then I'll have justice. You won't. Why? Because you have built your life about being a victim. And when the person that victimized you is gone, your identity is gone. You no longer have a reason to live. Because you have lived every day to bring justice to that person. You have lived every day to one day face her and say, and now that she's gone, you've got nothing to live for. How miserable is that person? I'm not saying you haven't been wronged. I'm saying this. Jesus Christ was victimized. And he, unlike you and I, never did one thing wrong. And yet he was hung naked on a cross. And so maybe that little thing that she said or that thing that she did or the thing that he did to you, maybe it pales in comparison. And let me ask you this question. What did Jesus Christ say on the cross to those who were crucifying him? He said, Father, get him. That's what I would have said. Number one, I wouldn't have been on the cross. There would have been, Jerusalem would have been a smoking ruin. But Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said to those who were crucifying him, as they were doing so, Father, forgive them. And then he gave grace and mercy, for they know not what they do. You see how the Lord went into the very heart of them and said, they don't even understand how wicked and horrible they are. They're not doing it for the same purpose that it appears that they are. That's grace and mercy. If you want to be miserable... Don't ever look at somebody's heart and say, well, maybe they don't know what they're doing. Never do that, because that may cause you to realize that person is human just like I am. And maybe I've gotten mad at Adam and Eve because of what they did, but I might have done the same thing. I might have chosen to sin. Look at Genesis 45. Genesis 45. Genesis 45, and let's read just several verses here, 1 to 5. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. How do you think they came? (laughs) They came near. I think they were trembling. I think they were, like their eyes were everywhere. What is he doing? He probably has a sword. He's got a gun. He's got something. 
His brethren could not answer for their trouble in his presence. They came near, and he said, I am Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves. You know one thing that a person who is victimized never considers that the person who victimized him or her may be upset with himself or him, herself because of what she did. The person who's victimized rarely thinks about that person who perpetrated the crime as being sorry for what he did. But it could be, it could be so. Joseph said, don't be mad at yourselves. You think he's being facetious? I don't think so. I think he was being sincere. He had forgiven them so much that not only could he cause them to come near to him, he said, don't be angry with yourselves. He, 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 he attributed to them uh, more grace than I could possibly have done. And then he said this, for God did send me before you to preserve life. This was part of God's plan. Now that blows my mind. The victim said, what you did to me was all part of God's plan. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that what happened to you was part of God's plan. I just don't know how. I I can't say that. But I am telling you, here's a victim that said it. Here's a victim that looked his, his victimizers in the eyes. And he said, come here, guys. What you did, it's all part of God's plan. Now, who do you think was the victor in that situation? Who do you think was the victim? It wasn't Joseph. It wasn't Joseph. And you say, well, yeah, I could do that too. If I was a second in in Egypt, I can tell you this. Joseph forgave his brothers a long time before this point. He got right with God, and he was living a victorious life before he ever reached this point. By the way, I believe that's why God put him in this position. Because he got past the junk. He got past the challenges of his childhood. He got past the victimization that he experienced. He, did not, he didn't look at himself as, poor old me. You see, guys, we look at ourselves as, well, of course. <laughs> of course I never win. I never can do anything. I never get anything. No one ever cared. Because look at all the stuff that happened to me. And maybe it did. And maybe your life is a, is a graveyard of buried hopes. And maybe it's horrible and terrible things have happened. But I'm telling you guys, you're not the only one that's happened to You're not the only person that's been victimized. You're not the only innocent person that's been taken advantage of. It is life. It is this wicked world that we live in. It's humanity. Men mess everything up. They take God's perfect creation and they burn it to the ground and they tear it up and they kill one another. They attack and they destroy. And God somehow, through all that junk, can preserve your life and use it to not only rescue your own heart and mind, but to then turn around and be a blessing to the people who destroyed your life. That's how great our God is. That's how great our God is. If you want to be miserable, see yourself as a victim. Now, if you want to be miserable, I've got, I've got uh, I think, four more. We'll, we'll move on quickly here. Here's another one. This is on a completely different tack. Go to, if you would, to uh, Proverbs 11. In order to maintain your miserableness... Hold yourself to an impossibly high standard. This is very effective, especially for people who are perfectionists. People who believe someday they'll get it all together. All the colors in the house will match, and the glasses will be pointed in the proper direction in the cabinet. All of the forks will match, and the knives, and the spoons And all of the food in the fridge will have its proper label pointing outwards that I might see it. At some point, everything will click and the trumpet will sound. That's a good way to be miserable. Look what it says in Proverbs 11, 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Some people attach their identity to their productivity. They attach their self-worth to how well they did. And let me give you an idea. If you're worth so much, why did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? 
If you're so wonderful and good and just two steps from higher ground, then why do you need God? I'm not saying you shouldn't try. Hey, I'm glad that you clean up your house. I'm glad that you clean your car out. I'm glad that you take care of your clothes and they're color coordinated and everything is the exact shade in the closet. I'm glad that your shoes are very carefully put in there with tree, you know, shoe trees and, and uh, you know, all kinds of... I'm glad that you have all of your socks folded and in the exact correct thing. Uh, I'm glad that your, your sweaters are all lined up. I'm glad that your food is alphabetized. I think those are wonderful things. But if you think somehow having these things are, is absolutely necessary to your happiness, you're a miserable puppy. And if things go out of place somewhere, you can't be happy. I'd say this. Being a perfectionist is pretty hard on yourself. It's a good way to be miserable. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. You know what the merciful man does to his soul? Well... You messed up again. Aren't you glad for the Lord? Aren't you glad that you have the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ? See, a person that doesn't have mercy on themselves, they go, Idiot! You know better than that. You were raised better than that. Get up. Do more. Get busy. Stop being a lazy bum. You got better in you than that. You know what's right. You know how to do it. Get up and go, 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 go. I'm just telling you, that's a good recipe for being miserable. Why? Because it is a falsehood. You cannot be perfect. Deal with it. You are lying to yourself. What do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That you can get it all right and do it all right. You see, what you have a problem with is self-righteousness. It's the same kind of people that looked at Jesus Christ and said, we don't need you here. Get, hey, get out of here. We got the whole law. We got the prophets. We got everything we need. We don't need Jesus. Why? Because they paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin. They tithed their spices. They were very meticulous. They measured everything. They had it all under control. They were, they were perfectionists. And in doing so, they didn't even recognize the importance of Jesus Christ. You see, what we want to do, again, is the two extremes. Well, if I live like that, I would just be a lazy slob. Well, maybe you would be a little bit lazier than you are. Maybe you would be a little bit more of a slob than you are. But maybe you would recognize and appreciate the grace and mercy of God. To a perfectionist, a type A alpha male, he doesn't need grace and mercy. He needs one more chance. One more chance. Sometimes I play basketball growing up a lot. We'd play street ball and we, and we'd get my team, we'd get beat by somebody. And you know, as soon as you get beat that bad, you know what you want to do? Play again. And you get beat and they, they dunk on you and they rub it in your face and they steal the ball from you and they make you feel like a three-year-old. And as soon as you get beat, you know what you want to do? Play again. I want to play again. Why? Because I know I'm better than you. What data do you have to support that? I know I'm a better Christian than this. How, how good are you exactly? Do you have any kind of a track record, any kind of history, any testimonies from other people that can say, yeah, now that's a good Christian right there. You see, in our hearts sometimes we are miserable because we think I can be better than this. I can do more. No, no, no. If you're a child of God, you're crucified with Christ. And if you do it in your flesh, you're resurrecting an old nasty corpse and going through the motions. And God goes, oh, my God. Oh, what is that smell? It's me, Lord. I'm serving you with all my heart. Please don't. Stop. Go back into your coffin where you're supposed to be. You see, what the Lord wants you to do is not to be this incredible Superman that does all things right with a cape. What he really wants is for you to allow him to work through you. And so when you wake up one day and you don't get everything done that you thought you were going to get done, and your kids didn't get to all the lessons in the karate and the, ba- you know, the ballet, and you, and, and, and you had to make peanut butter and jelly for supper, even though you had things on the list of, you know, what you were going to make, and it was very good, and, and, and you couldn't get everything exactly done like you wanted, you didn't read all your Bible, and you didn't pray fervently with compassion for 15 minutes, oh Lord, please, 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 I, I gotta go. <clears throat> You might just come to the realization that, I guess I do need Jesus after all. I guess I really do need the Lord. Huh. Who'd have thunk it? 
I need Jesus. I'm telling you, if you want to be miserable, a good way to to be miserable is to pretend like you can do it all. You know, Elijah killed 400 prophets of Baal. That's a pretty good work, good, good day's work. 400 prophets of Baal, and what happened to him? He was wiped out. He was so tired. He was so tired that Jezebel comes along and says, I'm going to get you and your little dog. And what did he do? He ran. He had just killed 400 guys, priests. Now, they probably were, you know, effeminate. But 400 of them, that's a pretty good day's work. If you can kill 400 guys, I think you can handle one woman. But he ran. Why? He was tired. He was wiped out. And what the Lord did, the Lord had come to him and say, Elijah, you call yourself a prophet of God. You, where's the power? Where's the Pentecostal fire from above? Where is your loyalty and devotion to me? You know what the Lord said? Elijah, send an angel. Wake up. Eat this. Okay, take a nap. And then he slept for a long, long time. And he woke up and said, hey, Elijah, wake up. Here, eat this. And he ate it. He was eating and sleeping. How spiritual is that? To some of you, that would be a real spiritual thing for you to do. (laughs) Most of us, no. Most of us, we don't need to eat anymore. We don't need to sleep anymore. But some of you have real hard drivers inside of you. Cracking the whip. Go, go, go. And that message that we preached this morning, I think, would fit real well. Come unto me, all labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'll set the work schedule. You don't have to set it. Just go to the board, look at it, do what I tell you to do. You're going to have rest. You're going to have food. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. You're going to be able to eat as you work. You're going to have a good time when you're following me. So if you want to be miserable, hold yourself to an impossibly high standard. Here's one, Philippians chapter 2. Imagine the motives of other people. This will help you to be miserable. It will, it will keep your mind occupied for days. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Imagine the motives of the people if you want to be miserable. Or, as the Lord said, let the other person look at them and say, they're better than I am. What are other people thinking about you? Probably nothing. That's just your ego talking. (laughs) They're probably not thinking much about you at all. If they're thinking bad about you, what are you going to do about it? Well, it's like the Giff used to talk about uh, the, in Russia. You know, he said, there's a Russian vodka company that said they're going to come to America and they're going to put a bottle of Russian vodka on every table in America. And he's like, well, what, you know, do you think they're going to break down the door? There. It's, it's not going to happen. See, we think the worst and we like to think the worst because then I can continue to be the victim. But guys, maybe they have bad thoughts. Maybe they're not thinking about me at all. But if you want to be miserable, start thinking about why she didn't shake your hand. Why she didn't invite you to the shower. Why he didn't come over and say hi to you. Or why he avoided you. Start imagining the motives. Here's another one. Believe that at a certain point when a certain thing happens in the future, you'll be happy. This is a great one. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you want to be miserable, focus, focus exclusively on the future and ignore the present. Don't think about today or the good things that God's given you. Don't think about the fact that you have life, that you have the word of God, that you have family, that you have a church that loves God and supports you. Don't think about that. Think about how just down the road, when my health turns around, or when I finally find a spouse, or when I get that job, or when I finally get rid of this rattle trap car, or we get into a decent house and not this shack, I'll be happy somewhere down the trail. But, 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. It's being like God and being happy in your own skin. It's having an attitude that really reminds people of Jesus Christ. And at the same time, just being happy. Enjoying where you are. 
You say, well, you know, you ought to have a little bit more, you ought to care a little bit more about yourself. And you ought to get this taken care of and get your house cleaned up and get that new siding. And you ought to get that driveway poured. And you ought to, well, maybe you should. Maybe you should. But, you know, I find that it's interesting. In third world countries that I've been to, I find that a lot of times there's more ready smiles. There's more of a relaxed, let's just have fun. Yeah, that's why their economy is in the tank. That's why they can't. And you're happy? And you're excited in the Lord? And you have joy? How much money do you make? To them, you make a lot of money. But it's not enough for you, is it? To them, you've got a lot of stuff. But you're just as poor as dirt. Poor, you know, just as poor as Job's turkey. Ain't got nothing, ain't got nothing. Isn't it amazing how we can sometimes believe that lie? But someday down the road, when that thing happens, I'll be happy. You know, the Bible says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Deferred means to be put off, to be postponed. What I hope for, what I really want, it gets put off in the future. And what does it do to my heart? It makes it sick. I'm walking around moaning, wishing I had something I don't have. Guys, who wants to be around somebody with a sick heart? Nobody. Nobody does. We don't want to be around people that are always talking about, well, you know, if I can get to that point, or when they, ever, they start hiring me, when they, start, when they actually start looking at what's going on, when somebody starts taking care of business and somebody wakes up, nobody wants to be around that person. You know what the kind of people we like to be around? We like to be around people that are happy in their own skin. And when we come around, they're not demanding things from us. They're just happy. They're talking to us. Now, you can't be happy if you're a lazy bum and you do nothing all day. But at the same time, if you get up and you work, 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 and never stop, you're not going to be happy either. You see, you do what you can do, and then you rest in the Lord to take the care, the care of the rest of it. You do what you can do, and then you give God the rest. I've got one more for you tonight. Go to uh, Philippians chapter 4. One more. Philippians chapter 4. Here's one more way to be miserable. Have you learned tonight? Has it been helpful to you to be miserable? Have you figured it out? Good. I trust we'll all be miserable by morning. We put these things into practice. The last way is to use your condition or situation to excuse your attitude. This is the last way. We've kind of trampled all over these here. It's kind of a scrapbook gumbo message. But use your situation or your condition that you're in to excuse the attitude that you have. Here's what Paul said about it, Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Wonderful. Well, what kind of courses did you take, Paul, to learn that stuff? Well, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You see, Paul could have complained. In fact, the Holy Spirit led him to record some of the challenges that he faced. Let me read it to you from 2 Corinthians. He said in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 23, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. 27 things he just listed. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? You want to talk about things that have happened to you? He put on his resume 27 thing, things that happened to him in the service of Jesus Christ. This was after he was saved. After he was surrendered to God, 27 things happened to him on a regular basis. He's having this and he's having that. He's having problems inside and fears within. He talks about over and over and over again. And what does he say? I've learned how to be content. How did you learn that? Well, one day my hope was no longer deferred. My ship came in and joy filled the air. Well, some days they were like that for Paul. 
And I don't mean to tell you that there's no days like that. And those days are wonderful. But guys, it's not reality, is it? All day, every day. That's reality for that day. The next day might be completely different. One day you love your spouse, your house. You love your church. You love your pastor. You love the Bible. You love the Lord. You're just, angels are singing. And, and, and there's, there's, the zephyrs are floating from the hills. And then the next day, you're not even sure if you're saved. You're not even sure if the Bible's true. And you don't, not, you don't think there's not one Christian down there that really loves the Lord. And pastor, he's just stuck up on his high horse, not living down where some of us actually live. <laughs> How is that possible? That's how you have to go to school to learn how to handle that stuff. You have to enroll in courses. Everybody enrolls in the course How to Abound, but the seats are empty when it's How to Be Abased. So the Lord has to kind of grab you by the nap of the neck and say, sit down. You're going to learn how to be abased. You're going to learn how to be made fun of, how to be offended, how to be upset, how to have people do things to you. We're going to have you learn this. Why? Why? So that you can say with the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I've got the power to be what Christ wants me to be. I can't do it. I've tried. But I just make myself more miserable. But through him, I can do all things through Christ. I can actually be the husband I'm supposed to be. I can be the employee I'm supposed to be. I can be the wife I'm supposed to be. I can be the kid I'm supposed to be. Or the parent. I can make it through this trial, through this sickness, through this disease. I can make it through this financial trouble. I can make it through this relationship battle that I'm facing. I can make it through this great fog of depression that's setting. I can do that through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can. I can do all things. All things. Through Christ. Could you be more miserable than you are right now? Well, you could. You could. Because all you have to do is put some of these. Some of you may not have thought of these. These are great ideas for you. Start implementing these in your daily life, and you'll be more miserable by morning. I guarantee you. But some, for some of you, a big change in your life would be just to stop doing one of these. How about that? Just stop it. You don't have to go out and figure out how to do something new. You have to stop doing